So good morning, everyone. Good morning. After Shavuos, it's very special that we can reunite again and now start actually learning the Torah. We started last week, Sha'ar Hayichod Vahayamuna, which is the gate to belief and to um, uh, uniting Hashem and understanding. That's the, the key point of the Alter Rebbe. And that's why the Alter Rebbe was imprisoned, is because he brought these deep concepts of Hasidus into what's called Chabad. Why are we called Chabad? Chachma bin Adas. Chachma bin Adas, exactly. Chachma bin Adas. It's logic. Chachma is wisdom. Bin is understanding. Das is uh, knowing, knowledge. So, this is what we're going to be doing today, is we're going to be trying to understand um, the existence of Hashem in a deeper way. So, this is chapter 2. I just want to briefly uh, remind myself about what we learned in chapter number 1. Chapter number 1 we began with understanding how everything that we see around us has to have a source of life inside it. Not only a source of life uh, uh, which is a nefesh, but also a connection to Hashem. Hashem constantly gives life to everything around us. That's step number one. And Alter Rebbe is going to build this up slowly but surely. And we spoke about the what is that uh, uh, energy that Hashem always uh, uh, gives to the objects around us. So we said it is the Hebrew of the Lashon HaKodesh word that it's called. For example, if we talk about the sky, so Shamayim has the exact energy and the exact amount of life that Hashem wants to give the skies. And we spoke about the animals, right? We spoke about Adam naming all of the animals. It wasn't just that Adam was bored in Gan Eden and he said, you know what, I've got a lot of spare time, let's start calling the animals by names. Adam Harishan was there, he had a mission, he had to understand the meaning of each animal and according to that, according to the meaning of that animal, what he did was he called it a specific name that's connected to that animal. We gave an example of a donkey, right? You remember the donkey is called a chamor. What is a chamor? Chomer. Chomer. Perfect. Chomer is materialism. Out of all of the animals, the donkey is very, very material. That's why it was used to carry things from place to place. It's, very, it's considered a lazy animal. And that is, uh, that is pretty much the idea of chapter number one. I just want to ask everyone here one question. Um, what, if, if there is, uh, we said that there's a 10... Uh, um, what's it called? Asaramama or the Ten Amendments or the Ten Sayings that Hashem said, right? There's a word for the Mamarot. The Ten. Ten utterances? Uh, utterances, yeah, right. I think that's that. Thank you, Hanoch. So, um, those basically are the key words to everything we see around us. But the Alter Rebbe asks in chapter 1, the Alter Rebbe says, well, where does it say a stone? Where does it say an Evan in the Asara Mamarot? Do you remember the answer? Where does it say an Evan? Or where does it say today um, um, other new things that were created? Right? Tzirofim Atiyot. Very nice. Tzirofim Atiyot means combinations of the letters. Not only combinations. Have you heard of Gimatria? Okay. For sure, right? Yeah. Gematria is a famous thing. It's a famous tool that we use in order to uh, understand connections between objects. So we say it has the numeric value of that name. Or let's say nature. The word of nature in the Shana Kodesh is Teva. And what is Hashem's name? One of Hashem's name is Elohim. The numeric value of Elohim is nature. We'll learn about it. It gives us a whole new understanding of the name of Hashem and also of nature. In Lashon HaKodesh, numeric values which are the uh, uh, gematriot and the tzirofim is the combinations. You open a Sephardic Siddur, have you over, opened the Edot HaMizrach Siddur? 
you'll notice in those Sidurim, especially the Arizal Sidurim, a lot of Mekubalim, what they did was basically um, they explained the names of Hashem according to the part of Tefillah that we are holding by. And you'll see there are different ways that they spell Hashem's name. It's usually in brackets. There's one way that we say it, but the spelling it's very interesting. I don't have here the Siddur of Edot Um I'm not sure if there's upstairs, but it's very interesting to just take a look and to see there. So let's see in chapter 2. Um, chapter 2, um, and I, I, I would like if we could do, uh, somehow we can read maybe a few lines. Each one can have uh, the opportunity to read. Um, starting from chapter 2, um, uh, it's here uh, on... Uh, everyone has a copy? There's um, Gabriel, do you have a copy? Okay, great, great. That's Ahavat Yisrael. This is all about Mount, Mount Sinai, everyone together. Okay, so Mordechai, please start for us the first, uh, the first lines. From the foregoing exposition, the answer to the heretics is deduced and the root of the error of those who deny individual divine providence and the signs and miracles recorded in the Torah is revealed. They error, making a false analogy in comparing the work of God, the creator of heaven and earth, to the work of man and his themes. For when a goldsmith has made a vessel, that vessel is no longer dependent upon the smith, and even when his hands are removed from it, and he goes away. The vessel remains in exactly the same image and form as when it left the hands of the smith. In the same way, these fools conceive the creation of heaven and earth by their eyes are covered, and they fail to see the great difference between... Okay, we're just going to stop here for one second. Thank you. Okay. Excuse me, how, this is how the original world was fools? The original wo uh, word for fools in the Shana Kodesh? No, in here. Because I'm very surprised using the word fools. Right. Yeah, no, uh, I don't know. Hakozeb, but you may know. Um, it's interesting. I don't know. The, the, this is. Uh, yeah, this is for <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> right. right, so let's, what Mordechai read out uh, to us, let's discuss this and see the meaning of the Alter Rebbe. There are two very important uh, things that we read constantly in the Torah, and one of them is specifically the stories of the Torah, but the other one is something that we carry till this very day. First thing is the miracles of the Torah. The Torah is full of miracles. Starting from the miracle of uh, um, the ten um, plagues that the Egyptians received. Hashem taking Am Yisrael out of Egypt, which was a, a, a miraculous thing for itself. But also Hashem performed many miracles during that time, such as splitting the Red Sea, such as providing Am Yisrael with the manna for 40 years. They had whatever they wanted to eat, any taste that they wanted. So the Torah is full of miracles. That's step number one. Then there's also something else that we speak about, what's called divine providence. Divine providence is hashgacha pratit. And this is something that we carry till this very day. Sometimes we may not see the miracles of Hashem as described in the Torah, but divine providence, this is a strong belief that Hasidus talks about many, many times. And Hasidus explains that the, the source of divine providence means that Hashem is constantly in contact with the world. Why is that? Because what is divine providence? Does anyone here have an example of divine providence? Or a personal experience of divine providence? It's got to be. <laughs> divine providence, we've got to meet that every single day. Yeah, when you, when you see that all these billions and billions of people and enemies of Israel, everybody gets food every day. That's the words of Rosh Brecher. It's a very nice example. Isn't that even the bigger miracle than the splitting of the sea, yeah. one time event? But every day, even the enemies get food. It's, that's a, it's, a, it's a very course, good point. There's miracles every day. Miracles every day, that's true. That's the right approach that we should have. And they are Nisim, 
miracles that are above nature, like splitting the sea and uh, things that don't seem logical. And there are miracles that are within nature. It seems to us that this is a, a natural Every process. baby that's born is a miracle. You are correct, 100%. It's a miracle. And sometimes people don't pay attention enough to notice the, uh, the miracle that's in that story. But nevertheless, uh, um, people that go through that experience for sure can say that there's something very special. They might not describe it as a miracle, but yes, miracles do happen. Let's talk about divine providence. So that's a miracle. It's also divine providence where Hashem takes care of us. And we can see it from time to time. We see how much during the Gulf War, so um, a lot of people were very, very scared about the situation in Eretz Israel. This is 1991, if I'm not mistaken, right? And what happened was is, is that a lot of people asked the Rebbe, they told the Rebbe, I've got a daughter learning in seminar in Israel. I've got a son learning in Yeshiva. We are planning to have a wedding in Eretz Israel. Should we cancel it? Should we bring our children back? And the Rebbe said, no, Eretz Yisrael is the safest place in the entire world. And then uh, people had a lot of confidence in the words of the Rebbe. And most of them listened to the Rebbe. And you can see that out of 39 missiles that uh, 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 landed in, in, in Tel Aviv, Aviv, Tel Aviv, only one person died. Only one person died. Exactly. And he died of a heart attack. A heart attack. Unfortunately, it's very sad. But... Um, uh, that is, okay, so people can say, you know what, maybe the missiles don't have such an effect. So you take a look in Saudi Arabia, there was an American base there, and with one Scud, which was the, the missiles that they fired, 300 soldiers were killed. 300 oh, soldiers, oh, approximately yeah. 200. Yeah. Yeah, you, you had the same type of miracle in Gush Katif. While, while the, uh, the Jews were, were dwelling in Gush Katif just before the disengagement, they suffered through 7,000 rockets fired on uh, New Dekalib, which is one of the communities. And out of those 7,000 missiles that were fired on the communities, only one person uh, was injured. And there are miracles after miracles that are that were told at the time. When someone got a phone call, they went downstairs to answer a phone, a missile went through the top of the uh, the roof of the building that they were in and exploded in the upper floor in the shower where they were about ready to take a shower uh, because of the phone call um, he went out yeah they went out and, and amazing they, and they were saved and they were saved from uh, uh from injury but this happened day after day after day especially so, so when we think about this, we understand that there's something special happening. What is the special thing? So in the words of the Alter Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe will give us a bit of an understanding. How do these miracles happen and the importance of these miracles and the importance of understanding divine providence. He just got a phone call and that saved his life. So this is Hashgacha Pratit and the way the Alter Rebbe explains is the Alter Rebbe says the people that don't believe in it, they are mistaken because they, they think that, you know what, Hashem created the world. But He created the world in the same way as any other, um, the words of the Alter Rebbe are about a tzoref. A tzoref is a, um, a goldsmith, right? A goldsmith that crafts whatever it is. Could be, uh, uh, it could be uh, a kiddush cup. So what, what he does is that there's no connection to him, uh, 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 but there's no connection between the cup and him after he finishes his job, right? The cup can live a, a, a long life without any connection to the person that actually made it. So people say the same things with the world. Hashem made the world, and now it's like uh, it's like a, a huge pilot. cup automatic pilot exactly but it's not true it's not true that's the point that the author is trying to explain to us that and what is the difference who can explain the difference between the uh, the mm -hmm. goldsmith making a cup silver cup and Hashem creating the world what is the difference why when you know they have these old ancient cups uh, kiddush cups from centuries ago um, and it's interesting to see it in the museums in Museum Israel, and they have also in the museum in Crown Heights, 
which is uh, the 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 um, basically to the library of the Rabbeim, starting from the previous Rebbe that brought a lot of the books and a lot of his possessions from Russia into the United States, and also there you can see special uh, items that are very unique. So what is the difference between that? That it could be centuries ago that it was made. And the person that made it, the goldsmith, is already not with us. And it's, there's no problem, it doesn't get, but with Hashem we say no. Hashem's always got to be with us. What is the difference between the two? Well, the difference is Hashem is there constantly. Why does it have to be in that way? You're right, that that's what he do. That's what, that's what he does. We accept it. We, we want to uh, understand what the Alter Rebbe is teaching us here. And Alter Rebbe wants us to understand why. Our big question is why. When we learn this parak, we can ask all the questions. And the one question is, why does Hashem always need to be in touch with the world, in contact with the world? Well, I, I think one of the big differences that you see between the goldsmith and Hashem is that the goldsmith made an object that has a lasting uh, presence. But Hashem is constantly managing the creation that he established. Be sure that everything stays in balance. Mm -hmm. You know, the more we understand the, the, what some of what science teaches us, the more we understand what a, a minute balance the world that we live in is. And if a, the smallest part falls out of the, out of a, a realm or a tolerance, everything comes to a halt. And it's only through the beneficence that Hashem has to keep everything in balance and operating that we're able to survive. And He does that because He created us and we're part of His purpose. Right. Very nice. I like that. This is where the author ever starts, uh, uh, starts explaining and bringing out his point. And still, we can make it a bit harder and we can still say, well, why? What is the fundamental difference between the two? So there's something that hides in your words that, uh, um, that uh, is the right way of looking at the world. And that's why we say the world and Hashem is a total different, uh, uh, it's, it's different than a person creating anything else or making anything else. Let's see it in the words of Al Tereba. And we are now up to... Let's start... Um, in the same way. Um, Benish, would you like to read yeah. for us? In the same, same way, way, these fools conceive the creation of heaven and earth, but in their eyes are covered, but their eyes are covered, and they fail to see the great difference between the work of man and his schemes, which consists of making one thing out of us, another, which already exists, merely changing the form and appearance from an ingot of silver to a vessel and the making of heaven and earth which is creato ex nihilo 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 that's an italian word isn't it it's latin latin, latin. Ah. Sure. indeed this is even thank greater you miracle. Sure. Okay. okay so we're just, just going to stop here for now because um, what the Alter Rebbe uh, um, says at this point is that there is a big, big difference, and this is where we come to one of the famous concepts in Hasidus, which is Yesh Me'ayin. We learned in the previous year, and this is a, a scientific fact, that Masa, right, never disappears. It cannot vanish. What can happen to a Masa is that it can transform and that is basically what a goldsmith does any person that does uh, uh, that does craft right or he changes things or he makes new things he what he does is he basically uh, uh, changes the form. the form of the object that we had previously. But he's, he does not create something new. Um, but when we talk about Hashem, Hashem creates the world, may ayin the yesh. And in the words from nothing, here, from nothing. from nothing into something, and these are the Latin words, right? 
Am I right, Jacob? What, what is the, the meaning here? Um, yeah. Which is yeah. creator ex nihilo. Nihilo means nothing. Nothing, right? So it's, creator, it's a yeah. creation from nothing. And this is the first part where, where we understand the essence of the creation of the world. This is the definition of creation. What does it mean? We don't say, we don't say that, a, uh, that a goldsmith created the cup. He made the cup. He did not create the cup. Creating something means bringing it from, uh, uh, from nothing into something. That is the true meaning of creation. And that only exists by Hashem. The idea of yesh me'ayin. And now we can understand why a, uh, um, a goldsmith, there's no connection between him and the cup. But with Hashem, there's always got to be a connection between Hashem and what he created the world. So what kind of a cup is it? A Yiddish cup or a Vaisha cup? I'm the Yiddish cup. That's a Machaya Eskula. Right. Hashem always constantly gives life to everything around us. So this is the difference. When it's something that already had an existence before the goldsmith, which was a basic piece of silver or even uh, um, uh, a gold that was still in the ground it, it existed before him the only thing that he did the goldsmith was to change the form of that basic piece of gold or silver that's the only thing he did he did not create something new the piece of gold already existed all he did was change the shape uh, added a bit of decorations and that is why the cup can continue living without him. But with this world, what happened is that Hashem created it from nothing into something. And therefore, he's always got to give energy to the thing that he created. Because without that energy that he, would, that he needs to give to the world, the world would to return to the same position as it was before, which means the world would not exist. Is that understood? Can we understand now the difference between the uh, uh, creation of the world by Hashem, which is in the yesh from nothing into something, compared to a goldsmith making a, a cup? Mm. Now we are getting a bit more to understand it, right? This is just changing the format of the gold and silver. When it comes to Hashem, we are actually creating a new object. That's why when it's a new object, let's see the Alter Rebbe's example here. The Alter Rebbe will give us a great example. Okay, so um, Tzvi, would you like to read for us the um, Indeed? Indeed, this is an even greater miracle than, for example, the splitting of the Red Sea. Uh, for then, God drove back the sea by a strong east wind all the night, and the waters were divided and stood upright as a wall. If God had stopped the wind, the waters would have instantly flowed downward, as is their way and nature, and undoubtedly they would not have stood upright as a wall, even though this nature of water to flow downward is also created at Milo for a stone wall even though when for a stone wall stands erect by itself without the assistance of the wind but the nature of water is not so so this but, is Yishakoya, thank you this is a great example of uh, uh, to explain to us the idea of yesh me'ayin. what is uh, yesh me'ayin. You said that the world that Hashem created is yesh me'ayin, which means the, the, the words again in Latin is ex nihilo, which is basically from nothing into something, and that's why it's always constantly got to have the energy and the power from Hashem. And again, the question would be why? Shechad so al gives us a great example from the miracle of splitting the Red Sea. And in the miracle of splitting the Red Sea, it says, the Pasuk says, um, Hashem is Hashem Kadim Azo Kol Halayla. 
All of the night, Hashem blew this, I think a Ruach Kadim is a western uh, wind that Hashem, uh, um, that Hashem brought. And basically what happened was, is that because of that wind, that was the miracle, the, wa the, the, the water split and it turned into a wall. So a lot of the non-believers say that it wasn't Hashem, but nature that blew that wind and made the, uh, right. the water split. Right. But nature could make the nature, nature, but nature, nature could make is the Hashem. water stand on edge. So. But nature is Hashem. Nature is Hashem. That's one thing. And also, it's, as also as Hanaf is saying that this miracle was pretty much a perfect miracle. So uh, sometimes what what the waters can do is what uh, what winds can do is like a tsunami or a typhoon or a bit of a flood, but it can't really cause the walls to become um, uh, right. like, exactly. But you're right, that the nature itself is Hashem, and these are all deep things that we are going to speak about in the in the in these the upcoming time, chapters. I would say most of the time that Hashem performs a miracle, it, may, it looks like nature. You might have to make 100%. it look like nature. This is what where we started. If you remember in the beginning, the Altar Rebbe says there are these fools that don't believe in miracles. And now he wants to disprove them. Disproving them is by explaining that nature itself is something that Hashem constantly recreates every moment. And then you can easily say, well, if he's in contact with the world, then he can perform any miracle, he can change anything, right? It's not really centered on an a, a, a automat, automat pilot, right? But he's always there flying uh, the plane. So, this is the example that the Alter Rebbe brings. He wants to explain to us what does it mean, yesh me'ayin, that from nothing there's something. And he says, um, there was the story of the Kriyat Yamsuf. And the Kriyat Yamsuf, the nature of water is always to flow downwards, right? Water doesn't go upwards, it doesn't even stay still. If there's nothing holding it, so it will go down. That's why there's waterfalls, right? Waterfalls means that at a certain point, there's nothing holding the water, and the water falls down. Um, so that idea of Hashem being able to create a new nature, that until this day water always fell downwards, and now the water has this kind of nature where it actually stands up at, in a shape of a wall. And that is because of Hashem all the night, uh, blowing the special wind that uh, uh, gives life and gives, so, in, so to speak, a new nature to the water. Until now, water always flows down. Here, this miracle that Hashem performed gives it a new nature, and it has to be constant. Because the moment Hashem would say, you know what, I'm stopping, it would fall back. And that's what happened when the Egyptians, right? When, the Egypt, when Am Yisrael went out of the sea on the other side, so the Egyptians were still in the sea. And then Hashem brought it, to, uh, uh, canceled this new nature, and it went back to the previous nature. So this is Yesh Me'ayin. So anything new that a person creates, he has to be involved in it all the time. This is what the Alter Rebbe is explaining to us. Is that understood? This, right? This is, the, this is the miracle that we have, for example, and this can explain to us the way that Hashem creates the world. So... Let's move on to um, to that. Hanach, would you like to read for us? Thus, yes. if for the miracle of the splitting of the Red Sea, the continuous action of God was necessary, how much more so is it in, in the creation of being out of nothing, which transcends nature and is far more miraculous than the splitting of the Red Sea, that with the withdrawal of the power of the Creator from the thing created, God forbid, it would revert to naught and complete non-existence. Rather, the activating force of the Creator must continuously be the thing created to give it life and existence. These forces are the letters of speech of the ten utterances by which beings are created. Thank you. So, now the Alter Rebbe is bringing it into uh, this example uh, to what we know is the, create, uh, the creation of the world. And this idea that Hashem always constantly is in contact with the world 
And as we said, um, the ten utterances that Hashem said at the beginning of the creation are the ones that give energy and life to the world. But th the point here is to say that this always has to uh, uh, has to apply. It's a, a, a ongoing process where Hashem always gives life to um, to the things around us. Every minute, he Every minute. rejuvenates. It. Exactly, that's the point. Now, what is greater? Now, this is the question. What is greater? Uh, the Kriyas Yamsuf, the miracle of Hashem splitting the sea and creating a new thing that water now, instead of falling downwards, stands up still, or the creation of the world? Creation of the world. Why? You're right. This is what Dr. Rebbe says. Dr. Rebbe says, Kol Sheken Mekalvachaymer. Who knows what a Kalvachaymer is? Kol Sheken Mekalvachaymer. How much more so? How much more so? Exactly. That's the best way to translate it. How much more so when we come to discuss the creation of the world? So if by Kriyas, Yantav, the splitting of the Red Sea, Hashem needed to perform this miracle, this ongoing miracle, how much more so when He creates the world, He's also got to constantly give life and energy to the world. Why is creating the world more of a challenge? So to because speak? there are more variables. Um, interesting, interesting. It's just, but, but, but let's talk quality-wise, because you're right. So let's just say what Hanoch is explaining here. It's a great answer that uh, there are many more things. That's just one nature. But when we're talking about many uh, natures, you know, each object here has its own nature. The amount of space that it takes, you know, what the results, what happens with it, etc. So it's more challenging. But that's, you're right, quantity or Wise. But quality-wise, is there a difference? I just want to hear more of that. What you? Um, I, I, I think Nox's right. The creation of the world is, is, a, is a much greater miracle because the creation itself created the world that we exist, that we exist in now right. from absolute nothing. Uh, the parting of the Red Sea is something that we can look at and that's something that we can... Um, uh, in our limited uh, in our limited fashion, we can embrace, but um, but the miracle of parting the Red Sea is strictly a finite miracle. It's very limited in its scope. Can they say a word? Um, as opposed to the creation of the world, which takes place over something that we can't possibly comprehend. Right. So it's a, it's a good point. You now trying to attend more to quality, quality wise. That there is a difference between the quality that was used then and the quality that Hashem created the world. So we're going to talk about that. But, this, but the, the sea was already there. The sea, but the nature, right. The yeah. sea was there, but the nature of the water <coughs> was changed. And maybe that's even more than the creation of the world. I want to hear uh, uh, just one second, Gabriel. Uh, Yaakov first. Yaakov first. Okay, what other Israel we have here. Amazing. <laughs> Yaakov. If you ever saw the Apollo 12, when the water was coming out, it was still, it was moving. Where? What, what do you mean? The, the Apollo 12. Apollo. Oh. Yeah. Oh. The right. water is still. It's not moving. Because there is no gravity. Mm. So the water Effect. is still. Effect. This is space. Right. Another face. So this is an explanation another, to another, the miracle? Another face of nature. Obviously. Another face of nature, exactly. Yeah. So what what is what what are you trying to explain here that the, the that the miracle of the Red Sea? I would was... say, as you said before, there are miracles that are within nature mm. and miracles that outside nature. Right. This might be a miracle within nature because the gravity, maybe the gravity in mm. that moment was withdrawn. Interesting point. It doesn't say about Am Yisra that they floated through, you know, like they do in space. Um, so it doesn't say that there was no gravity. Um, but no, the gravity was the where the water was, not, not on, on the Bayah uh, I see. But I see. Okay. But so so specifically where the water Homa, was, the, the gravity was taken. Okay, it's a, it's a very nice explanation. Um, right. It's a miracle, it's a miracle. but within nature. Yeah. It, it is, because the force of the wind that would be required to part the, the water and keep it parted would be more than you can bear to walk through that corridor. Um, if you've ever gone through a hurricane or, or high winds, 
you can't possibly stand up in in the force of those winds and they're not near enough to be able to, to cross get, the water exactly. part and stand part it for eight right. hours. So it's, it's, a, it's a miracle. The American world is that the land is dry. How could it be dry? <laughs> not interesting. Um, Right. Gabriel wants to say something. Gabriel. Oh, that is sure that the creation of God didn't have witnesses, but the splitting of the Red Sea there was many witnesses. Many Maybe witnesses. That makes right. the miracle something on a special level. So you're saying that the miracle of splitting the Red Sea is even higher than the creation of the world. Because we had witnesses. Okay. In that aspect, you're right. That there are witnesses. There are people that are able to see. Uh, the people that are able to see that uh, the fact that Hashem actually did that. But the point that the Alter Rebbe here is bringing out is that is that the creation of the world was a greater miracle. Um, you're right that uh, when we're talking about the, the ability of the people to actually see the miracle, so Kriyas Yamsuf, many more people were able to see it. Um, Okay, so Nachman, I tell you, Nachman is already he 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 had the same idea, the Yuli, the Kaya Hayuli, which is uh, um, that this is the creation of the world that it started from Kaya Hayuli, right? <coughs> the question what they had on that issue is for many years. When you see all the planets, they are circling and circling with such a precision. Normally everything what has a, is moving at the time of year, the speed goes down. Yeah. So even the atoms, it looks like the atoms, there is no, it, doesn't, it doesn't slow down the speed in these atoms. So ah, for sure. That's what they say it, to understand that Hashem is recreating his creation to give energy to it's a them. brand new day for the sun today that's why the sun goes in the sun you're right 100 percent. that's another proof it says that there's in the words of Hasidut, the proof is which means that the proof is first of all from what you said the army of the sky exists in the original Be'ish, which means in the human, which is basically the original sun, it's the same sun. And for, uh, uh, for f over 5,000 years, right, uh, 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 5,782 years, the same sun is shining every single day. It's got to be that there's someone that gives it power and energy, and also from the fact that around in this world we see that the species, which is the Min, the species also have an ongoing existence. It's not that they suddenly, mankind disappeared, right? And also with the animals, right? Certain species, they, with, uh, with the years, they basically uh, vanish. But the majority, the big species, they're still around. So, yeah, these are all great proofs. So that's, yeah, You know, I think about an individual that's brilliant and he works and develops motor from nothing all the parts, all the time it took to figure out each little piece to make this motor work and to do what it was created to do. Now someone comes along and says, we want that motor to split the seat. Well, he should spent seven days, some say a thousand, seven thousand years to, to develop this motor. Now all of a sudden, everything that motor is designed to do it's, he's got to change. If you go to a guy that designs motor, he says, well, shoot, I have to start from scratch. <laughs> the, the, right. Everything is not designed for that. Right. And the ship designed it a certain way, so when he does a miracle, it goes against everything to design. And know, nature of The nature of everything. It goes into mm -hmm. and it makes it hard. Even rain, you know, I was listening to Rabbi, I said, rain is a very difficult thing. And he was talking about why and how it takes a shim or effort to create rain. And I'm just God, it's part of nature. Well, what's so, why, why is rain? And this is why we need to appreciate all the things that we have around us because it's not so obvious and simple.
And here again, this is the idea that there's Hashem constantly, and in a certain way, this is how it's not 100% like that mechanic, or um, that engineer taking um, making the motor, where has, uh, the, the person making the motor, he has objects that already exist, and he just he's got it with talent. He's got to transform them, and he's got to make them suitable for the motor. And that is why, if someone suddenly tells him, "Yeah, you've got to change a certain thing. This is uh, we've got to recall uh, this," so he'll get frustrated definitely because. He put in so much effort with Hashem. He is, um, uh, he's constantly giving it a, a, a life and energy, and in that way, it's easier for him to change things. It's easier for him to basically, uh, um, to base. And this is where miracles come into the story, where Hashem did create a certain thing with a nature. It's got a specific nature, right? where water uh, falls downward. But because he's always in touch with the water, he can send a quick command that now the nature of water, instead of uh, um, falling downwards, can stay still. Uh, but you are right that for Hashem, in various cases, Hashem, one of the most important things is that Hashem doesn't do miracles in vain. <laughs> he doesn't do miracles for free. It's not for a show. There's an explanation to each miracle. And why? It's because Hashem made this nature. The nature is important. Hashem doesn't want to just change the nature. He might be able to, right? And this is what we're explaining here, that he has the ability to do it. As a matter of fact, there were seven miracles that were established before the creation of, of the world. Split of the sea, right. the Aton speaking. The Aton. But the others, they are within nature. Within nature. It's interesting. It's an interesting explanation to that, right? Otherwise, yeah. there would be, have been the need for the seven miracles right. before Because Hashem, Hashem, yeah, Hashem doesn't want to create new things. Things that en chadash, tachad Hashem, nothing is new. So, um, back to what we, uh, what we spoke about. Uh, what is a great uh, miracle? A miracle of creating the world or the miracle of splitting the Red Sea? And uh, um, you all brought great points out. I'll say it in the words of the Rebbe over here. Okay. So, uh, uh, the reason why the creation of the world is a greater miracle than creation of the miracle of the Red Sea, where the nature of the water is now to stand still instead of falling downwards, is because um, of the fact, and this is a deep idea that's brought in Hasidus, where, where we say that what uh, what is more obvious, the yesh or the ayin? What what it, what should exist? Ayin. Ayin. Very good. So just again to explain the question is, what what is more obvious in our eyes? Nothing. Or the existence of the world when we in, in the eyes of Hashem, right? Or in our eyes, but looking about what what goes through, so to speak, Hashem's mindset. How should it be that there is a world or that there's not a world? There is also the Hasidic idea of Ein Yesh. Ein Yesh, right. That's more of when you do a Fabreg and we're going to speak about Ein Yesh. Right. What was the question again? The question again is that... Is, is that... Um, if, if you are now advising Hashem regarding creating the world, we're not advising him, but if it says that, uh, Hashem consulted with the Neshamas of the Tzadikim, and the Amech Kulam Tzadikim, each and every one of us. It's a whole explanation to that, that in a certain way, the Neshamas of Am Yisrael, each and every one of us over here, we 
uh, uh, fulfill Hashem's will in the world, and that's how we basically convince Him to create the world. But if you think about uh, God Almighty, and the fact that He is unlimited, and He is undefined, as a result, would you say that it's that He should create the world, or not create the world? The existence of Hashem, does that carry out a result of a limited world, of a material world, or this what the situation that was pre-creation, where there was nothing, everything was unlimited, undefined, we don't even understand what existed there. But we know that, that there was a certain point where there, there wasn't space, time, and uh, massa. Chomer. There wasn't all of those things. What? He's a king without a kingdom. Okay, this is a Hasidic Shavar. So you're saying that he's a king and he's and therefore there's got to be a kingdom. So he should create the world. That is when we talk about a king, and this is a, a, it's a deep point. When we talk about a king that uh, needs the people, so you're right. But Hashem, he's so unlimited and he's so undefined that he can be a king even without the people. Yes. Today, people like that, we have a sugar, a person walking around that he's a king and he has no people that follow him, so he's just a sugar. Yes. But when we talk about Hashem, so we know that Hashem is unlimited. He can be a king even without the people. But you see, it's, 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 it's a good point. Our king wouldn't need the people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just want to hear the outfit. It makes it more difficult for Hashem because he's had to contract to allow space for us. Exactly. Symptom. He's got to contract. He's got to remove himself from a space, so to speak. We'll talk about the meaning of that. And therefore, basically what you're saying is that, that what's obvious is not uh, Hashem creating the world, but it's Hashem not creating the world. That's the result of the existence of Hashem. His great existence leads us to a point where we say that this world is a wonder. Why would he create it? He shouldn't create it. Benish, you wanted to mention something? Yeah, okay, okay, uh, our king created the world for us. Other kings create the people the in the world for them. For their front. For them. Right. So, so all of this leads us to the point that the creation of the world is a greater miracle than changing the nature of water. Changing the nature, the nature, the nature of water is after Hashem created the world. Hashem says, I'm going to play a bit of a game. In order to save my people, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to change the nature of water. Okay. That's not a wonder. You say, well, how did he do it? It's a miracle. He needed to change nature. Great. When Hashem created the world at the first place, the first time, I'm sure if we were there, right, and let's just imagine it, we would tell Hashem, Hashem, what are you doing? You are unlimited. You are undefined. Space doesn't mean anything to you. Time doesn't mean anything to you. Why are you creating the world? And then Hashem says, I want the benefit of the uh, neshamis, of the good deeds that, that the people that Am Yisrael will do later on in the world. And that's the explanation, but when we start from our the first point of view that we have of our understanding of what Hashem is, what Hashem means, He is unlimited. Why do we want a world? That's why it's a greater world. Yeah, no, yes, no, our discussion is assuming that the creation that we are part of is the only creation, you know, but beyond time and space, beyond our understanding, Hashem may have also simultaneously created other creations that we're not aware of or not part of. Um, but, uh, but we're looking at the creation that we are are part of at this point in time. You mean um, uh, spiritual creations, Olam Briya, Yitzhira, Siya? Both, both, both right. spiritual and physical creations. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, we we can't comprehend what Hashem has made right. or created. No, and, 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 and much of what we're looking at an understanding is only what we can see and feel and touch and to give us information beyond what we already 
can 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 embrace is more than than, than we can handle. Right. I think the reason uh, in Aftara when they speak of Mars, there right. are people on Mars. They, they are certain, it's very interesting, I think there are certain oh, hints in the biblical, in the Bible, yes. that hint that there is life besides earth. But it's hints and we don't know and um, um, I think they asked the Rebbe once, is there life on other places? Um, so the Rebbe says that we've got to uh, We've got to take interest, or if it helps us to add and increase in serving Hashem here in this world, then it's good. But if it's just to, um, you know, to fantasize about these other worlds and other creations, it might even cause us a bit of uh, what we call bilbul, confusion in our world over here and, in, and about our mission here in the world. So it's better to avoid it. If it helps us serve Hashem, why not? If it doesn't, but it's about it. So let's just finish here. And this is basically the, the last part of um, of the second chapter, and we'll end over there. So, um, Gabriel, would you like to uh, read for us the last part? And uh, it is, and that is the meaning of the word the Atta Mechaye et Kulam, not Mechai, give life, but that you give life and there is that you bring into being bring into being ex nilo the word atta you indicates all the letters from the alef to the tav and the letter he the five organs of verbal articulation the sources of the letters. Although he has no body likeness yet, scripture itself ascribes him. Anthropomorphoic, other the language of Jacob, terms such as, and God spoke, or, and God said, oh, what a tough language is that, <laughs> which denote the revelation of the 22 supernatural letters to the prophets and the clothing of the letters in their intellect and comprehension in the prophetic vision as well as in their thought and speech that is living. The spirit of God spoke to me and his words are upon my tongue. Where is written this? Sorry? The spirit of God spoke in me and this word is upon my tongue. Does it come from? It's one of the prophets. I'm not sure exactly which prophet, but we know that the, the whole idea of prophecy is basically um, a, a human being speaking the words of Hashem, sending the people the message of Hashem. The Spirit of spoke, spoke in me, and his words are upon my tongue, as has been explained by the Ari of Blessed Memory in the Shah Alehua. Similar to this is the investment of the letters and in creating things, and it is written by the Lord of God, where the heavens made, and by the breath of his mouth on their host. Only the enclosing of the letter in creating same beings is through numerous powerful descents des, 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 until the letters reach the corporal world of Asia, whereas the comprehension of the prophets is in the world of Atsilut, as it becomes known in the world of Bria. Bria. Thank you very much, Gabriel Shankar. So, uh, the Al Terebe explains, and this is where the Al Terebe ends. He says that this is the creation of Hashem. Not only Ba'atu Machaya, you don't only give life, but you actually bring to life. That's a difference. The difference between uh, 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 bringing to life is that you actually create the thing from nothing into something. And then Al Terebe ends with an interesting point. How can we refer to Hashem as someone that speaks, someone that talks? Hashem 
isn't a human. Hashem doesn't have a, a, a body or something like that. And then he says that this is just an example. In various places in the Torah it says the hand of Hashem. Or the eye of Hashem, right? What does it mean that Hashem actually has a hand or he actually has an eye? No. It's what an eye represents. It says about Eretz Yisrael, and we spoke about this, that, uh, that, the, that um, during the Gulf War, uh, the Rebbe said that this is the safest place. Why? Because it says in the Torah, Enei Hashem The eyes of Hashem are on the land of Israel. Mereish Yisashana Vadach Yisrana from the beginning to the end of the year. Which means this, what does it mean the eyes of Hashem? Hashem is not looking there with a telescope, but his, what the eyes represent, his attention. His affection towards Am Yisrael is great. When you say, I'm going to I, I lay my eyes upon this person, it means you pay a special attention to this person. You notice him. This is the idea. Whenever it says in the Torah, and this is a law that we've got to remember, because thinking that Hashem is actually some kind of human being or has figures of a human being, that's idol worship. Hashem doesn't have that. And there were many people that made this mistake. And the Maimonide comes and the Maimonides, the Maimonides says, that there is no real uh, figure to Hashem that we might think that he has. And these are all examples and they are basically parables that the Torah brings in order to explain to us certain inyanim. Thank you very much, Shakoyach.